Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure being here at uh, this uh, Congress and event. Uh, what I'd like to do is to give you a bit of my outlook, the one of myself and my team at Rubini Global Economics. This is my research consultancy on what's the outlook for the global economy, for financial markets, and of course, given uh, the interest of this conference, what are the implications for uh, the oil market. Uh, if you look at the global economy today, there is a bit of a gap between what I say is happening on Wall Street and what's happening on Main Street, uh, what's happening in financial market and asset prices, and what's happening into real economic growth. Uh, since last summer, risk has been mostly on rather than off, volatility has been lower, and a variety of risky assets like the US uh, and global equity have been rising over time, while credit spreads both for high yield and high grade remain uh, relatively tight, if not uh, falling. So financial markets are actually quite positive about global economic growth and what's going to happen uh, to asset prices. Uh, we've had much less of that risk aversion that we had seen in previous episodes in the last few years. However, if you look at the global economic growth, the picture is much uh, weaker. I was recently in uh, Japan where they have had for the last decade uh, a quadruple uh, deep recession and abenomics uh, very aggressive has been as a way to avoid a quintuple deep recession and, uh, and avoid deflation. Uh, recently the headlines in the Financial Times about the UK economy where is there a risk of a triple deep recession. Uh, most of the Eurozone is still stuck into a double deep recession and that's spreading also to the core of the Eurozone. And while in the United States there is no worry right now about a double deep recession, economic growth remains anemic subpar below trend around one and a half, barely two percent. Until recently, economic growth was weak in advanced economies given painful deleveraging after financial crisis, but economic growth was robust in most emerging markets with few exceptions. But even in the M, right now growth is slowing down. Take the BRICS. Uh, China has been slowing down from a trend growth of 10% towards 7.5%. It's going to be lower. Uh, India used to grow 9% per year for a couple of years. The last couple of years has been only 5%. Uh, Brazil last year grow, grew less than 2%, this year barely 3%. In Russia, in spite of oil prices close to $100 per barrel, growth is barely 3%. And the last new members of the BRICS, uh, South Africa is barely growing in the 2 to 3% range. So even growth in emerging market is slowing down. So economic growth in the global economy remains weak, anemic subpar below trend in advanced economies, outright recession in parts of the Eurozone, weak economic growth in other parts of the advanced economies, and even emerging market that used to grow and overheat until a year or so ago, now they're slowing down and the growth rate is now falling below a trend and because of that their inflation rate is falling and certainly some of the correction we have observed in the last few weeks and months in commodity prices, a uh, variety of commodity prices including also energy, are driven by concerns about the slowdown of growth in emerging markets in general and in China in particular. And therefore global inflation, both headline and core, in advanced economies and emerging markets is becoming lower. Now, so what explains this gap between what's happening in asset prices that are rising and uh, in the real economy that are disappointing? And of course, within this kind of general observation, there is also the observation that there has been significant now volatility, especially in bond markets. Debate about how fast and how soon the Fed is going to exit quantitative easing and then normalize rate led to a significant increase in bond yields. That significant increase in bond yields has that significant impact, for example, on emerging markets. Emerging markets were already underperforming earlier this year because of the correction in commodity prices, because of the underperformance of their equities, but now worries about exit from QE have led to capital outflow out of the currencies in the emerging markets and out of even their own fixed income, local currency and foreign currency that lead into a significant increase in those bond yields and spreads. Uh, so that's the situation we're facing right now. Now, in my view, this gap between asset prices and the real economy is explained by three factors. First of all, uh, the tail risks that were worrying the markets a year ago are now reduced. A year ago, people were worried about collapse of the Eurozone, Greek exit, Italy and Spain losing market access. Thanks to the OMT, the ESM, and other policy actions, the tail risk can be reduced. Last year, people were worried about a 4% of GDP U.S. fiscal cliff pushing the U.S. into a recession. There is a fiscal drag, but the agreement in Congress 
implies a smaller fiscal drag. A year ago, people were worried about the Chinese hard landing when the economy was starting to grow less than 6%, but another round of fiscal and credit stimulus has led to some economic recovery in China. And finally, a year ago in the spring, as you remember, people were worrying about uh, the saber rattling by Israel saying enough is enough and threatening to attack Iran. Then U.S. successfully convinced Israel for the time being to give time and patience for sanctions and negotiation. And therefore, the spike in the fear premium we saw in the summer of last year tended to be reduced, reducing uh, oil prices. So those tail risks have, have been reduced. They're not eliminated. The second reason why markets are optimistic is while economic growth has been disappointing for the last few quarters, people say bygones are bygones. There is a global economic recovery. Policy actions are leading to a recovery of growth in the United States, a bottoming out of recession in the Eurozone soon enough, even economic recovery now thanks to economic in Japan, even some signs of a recovery in the United Kingdom. And while emerging markets are growing slower than before, around 5% per year, it's still close to their potential growth. So people say, let's look ahead, forward-looking indicator, global economic growth is going to be more robust, that's going to be good for global equities. The third reason why markets have been fraught and bubbly in spite of weak economic growth is that the policy reaction to this weakness in economic growth and inflation has been another round of monetary easing. Conventional and unconventional in advanced economies uh, things like cutting policy rates, aggressive forward guidance, quantitative easing, credit easing, you name it. But even in emerging markets, in a dozen of them, the slowdown of growth in the last few months and the fall in inflation has led to, to a cut in the policy rates. And therefore, easier monetary policy, uh, sh uh, lower short-term interest rates, more quantitative easing implies a wall of liquidity chasing assets. And those assets have been U.S. and global equities, have been high yield and high grade, and until recently, it was also emerging market currency and debt. Given the current concern about exit by the Fed, happening sooner rather than later, the correction in EM has been quite strong in terms of uh, both equities, commodities, FX, and now uh, fixed income. Uh, so that has been the concern that has occurred uh, in the market. But overall, a wall of liquidity chasing assets implies asset reflation. Now, if there is a growing gap between the real economy that is disappointing and financial markets are becoming higher, especially equity, only one of these two things have to occur. Either the policy reaction eventually is going to lead to an acceleration of economic growth in US, in Europe, in emerging markets that justifies these asset prices that are higher, or if the effect of quantitative easing are going to be minimal and that recovery of growth is not going to occur and economic growth is going to disappoint globally, then the correction has to occur for asset prices, lower global equities, a higher risk premium because of risk of default, lower commodity prices, and so on. And therefore, the key important question is what's going to happen to the global economy? <coughs> I tend to be more pessimistic than the consensus. Uh, the recession in the Eurozone is not going to go away for four reasons. Uh, one, there is front-loaded fiscal austerity. Two, the value of the euro is still too strong for the periphery. Three, there is a credit crunch with banks deleveraging by selling assets and contracting credit. And with high and rising unemployment rate, consumer and business confidence is still very fragile. So recession is continuing in the Eurozone. Potential growth in the Eurozone is weak because of aging of population and low productivity growth given slow pace of reforms. Debt ratios in the Eurozone are high and rising, private and public, domestic and foreign, because while you're working on the denominator of the debt GDP, if GDP that is denominator keeps on falling, your debt ratio is going to become eventually unsustainable. And the loss and lack of competitiveness as wages were growing more than productivity has not gone away. You still have massive overvaluation in the periphery of the Eurozone, and strength of the Euro doesn't help to restore competitiveness through internal devaluation. So I remain fundamentally concerned about the Eurozone remaining in recession, eventually bottoming out by having anemic, slow economic growth. And demand, for example, of commodities and oil in the Eurozone has sharply fallen because of this recession. Now, in the United States, there is an improvement of economic growth, but it's going to be still anemic subpar this year because of the fiscal drag, and maybe next year we're going to have barely 2.5% growth given a smaller fiscal drag. Now, one of the positive things about the United States, as we know, apart from the recovery of housing, the effect of QE, some improvement of the labor market, some reshoring, is the shale, gas, and oil revolution. 
But if you think about this shale gas and oil revolution and the implication for the oil market in particular, of course, you have that greater supply of shale oil and greater, of course, supply of shale gas that at some level becomes a substitute for the use of oil is going to be potentially a negative, of course, for the oil market. As I pointed out, emerging markets are also slowing down especially China, but also other ones. It's not just because of cyclical factor, but because their model of growth that is unbalanced, unsustainable, uncoordinated in China is broken right now. You have to switch from net exports to domestic demand, and within domestic demand, from fixed investment towards consumption. That's occurring too slowly in China. And in China and other emerging markets, there has been a movement away from market-oriented structural reform and a move towards models of growth of variants of state capitalism that have eventually implies a slowdown in potential growth. Too much of a role of state-owned enterprise in the economy, too much of a role of state-owned banks in allocation of credit and savings to investment, resource nationalism, import substitution, industrialization, protectionism. If those trends were to continue, the slowdown of growth in emerging markets could become uh, more significant. Now, how does this picture for the global economy, what does it imply for uh, <clears throat> for asset prices and commodities and oil in the specific. Now, if we're going to have continued recession in the Eurozone and then bottoming out but very slow economic growth, if US growth is going to be anemic, subpar, and below trend, and we have the increase in the supply of shale gas and oil, and if demand and growth in China is going to slow down, then in the oil market we have the following factors. Of course, the oil market depends on global economic growth and growth in the different regions. And some of the strength in oil market in the last few years was driven by the very strong economic growth in China and emerging market in spite of slow economic growth in advanced economies. But demand for oil is falling and has fallen in the Eurozone given the recession. Uh, demand for oil in the United States remains weak and remains weak because the recovery in the US is weak and because there is substitution from oil to gas. And there is, of course, also a process of energy savings and efficiency that occurs in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in advanced economies and emerging markets. So both cyclical factors and structural ones like movements towards energy efficiency suggest that there's going to be relatively weak demand for oil in advanced economies. In advanced economies, demand for oil is still below the peaks reached in 2008 and significantly below the average in 2005 and 2008. Demand for oil. In emerging markets, it's been growing very robustly thanks to China and EM growth for the last few years, very robustly, but now we have a slowdown in emerging market, we have a slowdown in China. That should slow down the growth rate of demand for oil. Of course, within China, consumption growth is going to remain robust even if fixed investment falls. And within consumption, the rise, and of course, in demand for cars is going to be to a significant increase in the demand for oil, not just in China, but in other emerging markets that are urbanizing, industrializing, with population growth and, and, and uh, per capita income growth. So certainly the demand for oil coming from greater car use in emerging markets is going to be significant. But on the demand side, where a world economy, where advanced economies are either contracting or growing slowly, where emerging markets are growing more slowly, where there's now demand for efficiency in the use of oil and fuels that reduces demand. And what's happening on the supply side? On the supply side, there is a surge of production, especially in North America. It's driven by the shale oil or tight oil revolution in the United States is driven by the oil sands in Canada. It's also, of course, driven by the fact that now, from Brazil to other parts of the world, there are now new discovered reserves of oil that are offshore. So supply is now increasing at a faster rate. Demand is growing at a slower rate. Inventories are now rising, and they have been significantly higher in the US and OECD countries compared to the past. And therefore, the fundamentals of demand and supply would suggest that overall, oil prices could be falling over time uh, gradually, uh, not significantly. Uh, I, my estimate and one of my colleagues that they'd say brand prices for the next few years are going to range between a low of maybe on average per year of $100 per barrel to something of a high of 110 Of course, within that average for the year, there can be a huge amount of volatility. Last year, 
oil prices range between $90 per barrel and $130. What that volatility is coming from is coming from the fact that one important determinant of oil prices, of course, is also geopolitical risk in general and those in the Middle East in particular. We know that previous global recessions that were driven by stagflation were caused by a geopolitical shock in the Middle East that led to an oil spike. The Yom Kippur War between Israel and the Arab States in 73, with a spike in oil given the embargo, the Iranian Revolution in 79, the 1990 Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and the spike in oil prices. And certainly even last year, the spike we saw in Brent for a few months was driven by the concerns that Israel might attack Iran. Now, I'm not a geopolitical expert. I cannot tell you whether that attack by Israel and or Iran against uh, Israel and or uh, United States against Iran will occur or not. The, the results of the presidential election in Iran, uh, there is this process of sanction and negotiation. Maybe a compromise could be reached. Maybe a compromise may not be reached. Maybe the US and Israel are going to leave and contain a nuclear Iran. Maybe if that's not acceptable, because Obama says containment is not the US strategy, all options are on the table and not bluffing. If that's true, then if negotiation sucks, are not going to work, you cannot rule out actually a military strike against Iran. If that were to occur, of course, you could have, depending on the shock to supply or to potential supply, oil prices going from $100 per barrel all the way even to $200 per barrel in a matter of months. Of course, that was going to cause a global recession. If that global recession were to occur, then there will be a collapse of prices, as it happened in every episode in which there is a spike in oil prices deriving from a supply shock that then leads to a shock to oil prices and demand destruction, a global recession that then lead to sharp fall in oil prices. As you remember, during the global financial crisis, around summer of 2008, oil prices peaked around $147 per barrel, but after Lehman, where the global recession was sharp and severe, oil prices bottomed out around $30 per barrel. The global recession, of course, damages demand and is going to lead to a very sharp fall in oil prices. So the summary I would give you of this economic outlook for oil prices is the following one. If I look at the overall fundamentals of demand and supply, leaving aside geopolitical risk, demand is going to be more subdued given what's happening in advanced economies, given what's happening in China emerging market than previous years, given also uh, policies towards energy saving. On the other side, supply is rising because of shale gas, shale oil, offshore uh, oil, oil sands, and other things, and therefore this balance of demand and supply overall would suggest that oil prices in the next few years could drift lower. I see the average of Brent this year around 188, sorry, 108 dollar per barrel. By 2015, the average could be closer to 100 dollar per barrel with great volatility. However, the wild card, of course, in all market remains geopolitical risk. If those geopolitical risk and the fear premium were to rise, oil prices could sharply rise. And of course, if there was an actual, as opposed to a threatened military conflict in the Middle East between Israel and the US and Iran, oil prices could go for a number of months, if not longer, to much higher prices before collapsing again, as that shock to oil prices is going to cause a global recession, like in 73, like in 79, like in 1990. Of course, however, longer term, even if the supply is greater, there will be a global economic recovery. Even advanced economies are going to go back to potential growth. The robust growth of emerging markets that are growing around 5% is going to remain. Urbanization, industrialization, more car use, more population growth, more per capita income growth are going to imply both industrial and consumer uses of oil for example, for car driving and other things. So the overall fundamentals of demand and supply remain relative balance, and therefore over the next few years, leaving aside the volatility, I see Brent oil prices in the 100 to 110 dollar per barrel with a greater amount of volatility. Final observation I'll make that is relevant is the question of resource nationalism. It is something quite important. Uh, whether it's in the case, for example, of taxes imposed on oil by the UK in the North Sea, or export restrictions to uh, exports of oil in the United States, or situation like in Argentina where one of the oil companies was uh, expropriated, or other forms of indirect or direct taxation or threats to uh, 
multinational corporations making investment in oil and energy. One of the rising themes in many emerging markets, but even in advanced economy, is the question of resource nationalism. In the case of Brazil, an increase in value-added tax on oil. So that's going to be an element of additional uncertainty. It's going to affect, of course, production, foreign direct investment, increasing the capacity in the short term and long term. There's going to be a wild card in affecting the supply of oil and therefore the long term value of oil prices. But overall, the outlook I gave you for the global economy has some meaningful implication for all markets and all prices in the direction that I provided you. Maybe I'll stop here and I'll open it up to any question you might have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Nuriel. <laughs> probably, Nuriel, Nuriel, probably you want to join me here. Uh, it's more yeah. comfortable probably also for you uh, sitting on, uh, next to me. Um, yeah. I want to start off with, with one thing we, we cannot avoid talking about because the whole market talks about it. It's QE. Yeah? Quantitative easing has been in the, in, the, in the news for the last uh, weeks, particularly yesterday again with the FEDS meeting. Uh, I recently read a note from one of our colleagues saying that QE is like a marriage. It's easy to enter but can be very painful to exit. Um, yeah, would you agree to that? And, and would you help me, you know, for me looking at the market on a daily basis, it's, it's getting confusing because Bernanke goes out there and says, you know, we see that the U.S. economy is actually, you know, developing, probably developing positive or there's signs out there. So we probably remove some of our, we moderate, I think he said, our, our quantitative easing program or just the possibility of moderating it. Uh, so actually that should be a positive sign for the economy, yeah, but the market as we look today in the morning in Asia, in the US yesterday, is, is, is trading negative. So what's, what's going to be the pain of exiting QE and what are the real results of QE? Was QE or will QE be successful in setting up sustainable economic recovery? Um. Well, you know, I think that the markets in some dimensions might be a little bit overreacting because the Fed for the last few months has been saying we're going to maintain QE until there's an improvement in labor market is substantial. The people talked uh, uh, was when the unemployment rate is closer to 7%. Then the Fed said we're going to keep zero policy rates until the unemployment rate is 6.5% and then we're going to gradually exit the normalized rate. So even when you finish QE, there is still a period of time where you have zero policy rates and then there is a pace of normalization. What Bernanke said yesterday is exactly consistent with that. He said that as we're getting closer to a 7% unemployment rate, sometime later this year, could be starting in September, as early as then, in my view is going to be later towards December, the Fed is going to start to exit QE. If you reduce your uh, QE by 15 billion, per month, 85, 15 billion, means in six months you are finishing with QE. That means, as he said yesterday, that by June of next year, if you're starting in December, you're going to end at QE. Or if you start in September and you reduce 10 billion per month, by June, you're going to end up QE. Then he said, we're going to keep zero policy rates until unemployment rate is around 6.5%. When that's going to occur? Towards the end of 2014, early 2015. So and more importantly, even after you exit zero policy rates, the Fed cannot exit and normalize rates as fast as it did in 1994 because that caused a bond market crash. They learned that lesson, and in 2004, 2006, it took them two years between middle of 04 and middle of 06, measure pace, pre announced 25 basis points every six weeks to normalize policy rates from 1% to 5.5. So they're not going to do a 94 bond market crash, they're going to exit very slowly. So if you think about it, the message yesterday was slightly more hawkish than people expected on when you start and exit QE, but was very dovish in saying we're going to keep zero policy rates until beginning of 2015 and then they know everybody is going to have to exit and normalize very, very slowly. So actually my worry is that financial market are already frothy right now with another year until you end QE, another uh, six months until you end zero policy rates and then another two years until the middle of 2017 where you're going to normalize fully interest rates. If there is fraughtiness in equities, 
in credit, in leveraged loans, in financial markets today, one more year of QE, one more year of zero policy rates, and then a very slow normalization implies that frothiness is going to imply eventually a huge bubble. Look what happened in the previous cycle. We kept interest rates too low for too long, then we normalized them too slow, too little, and we created a subprime bubble, a housing bubble, a credit bubble, an equity bubble, and a financial bubble, and the boom in the bubble eventually led to a, a bust and a crash. The risk is actually we're going to repeat the same mistake last time around. Not that we exit too soon, but we exit too late because the economy is weak, growth is low, unemployment rate is high, debt ratios are high, and the Fed cannot afford having a bond market crash. So the risk is not of too early exit, but too slow exit that's going to imply that this frothiness we see in financial market a year or two from now becomes a fully fledged bubble in a wide range of asset prices, and a boom in a bubble eventually could lead to a crash and a bust like the one we saw between 2006 and 2009. I think that's the bigger risk rather than tapering off three months from now or six months from now. Staying only a little bit with QE, uh, there is the argument that the shale oil or shale gas revolution probably does more to the economic recovery, particularly in the US, than QE in itself. Yeah? I think there are numbers out there that the unconventional, or the, 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 on the unconventional side, there are about 1.7 million jobs created in the US just on, on, on shale and tight gas uh, developments there. Yeah? To put my, my, my question a little bit more provocative, in, in the view of the US energy policies uh, of, of shielding their, their, their exports or not allowing for exports for crude as well as for shale, uh, providing incentives for a lot of companies and you know, only yesterday there was a, the headline in the Financial Times, first shale, now steel, it reads, there are a lot of manufacturers moving to the US, yeah, maybe in, in, in steel, maybe in petrochemical, whatsoever, trying to, to, to profit from, from the feedstock advantage. Is this happening on the cost of Europe? You know, I know I'm coming from Austria, first one of the biggest steel producers is moving to Houston for their new plants, yeah? And what can Europe do against it, yeah, to shield that? Well, on the relative importance of different factors to explain the U.S. economic growth, uh, there are several of them. Uh, our estimates have been that for the time being, the effects of the shale, gas and oil revolution on U.S. economic growth is to increase U.S. economic growth only by 0.2% per year relative to a baseline without that. It may be a little bit more over time, maybe 0.3, 0.4, as you become more and more into shale, gas and oil, but the exact number is small, while the effect of quantitative easing, Q1, Q2, Q3, on economic growth relative to baseline without those QEs are a bit larger. Uh, without QEs, probably economic growth in the U.S. per year would have been 0.4 to 0.5 percent lower than it's been otherwise. So on net, QE actually has had a meaningful effect, both through asset reflation, the wealth effect, the bond market effect, credit growth, the weakness of the U.S. dollar when the U.S. was the only one doing QE2 and so on. So the transmission actually has been meaningful. It's not huge, but has been somehow significant. Now, of course, in a world in which there is now a reshoring of manufacturing, and the reshoring of manufacturing is occurring for three reasons in the U.S. One is, of course, lower energy prices gas and oil. Second one is that there are a rising wage costs in China. Three, you have the third manufacturing revolution that is robotic automation, that is capital intensive, skill buyers and labor savings. So if the fact of the future is going to be 1,000 robots and just one worker sweeping the floors, of course the labor cost is going to be mattering much less than it does today. That's an extreme example, but it gives you a sense of much capital intensive as opposed to labor intensive manufacturing. So paradoxically, there will be reshoring of manufacturing to the US is going to create production, is going to create profits for the producers, is not going to create many jobs because it's very capital intensive. So the benefits are going to be to the owners of capital, to profits, and so on. So there is that reshoring. However, that reshoring, in my view, is going to occur only in very select energy intensive sectors, of course, chemical and petrochemicals, uh, fertilizers, maybe still a few other sectors of the economy that are very energy intensive. Other sectors like consumer electronics is, <coughs> is gone forever, it's gone to Asia, even with lower energy prices, is not gonna come. Now, of course, in terms of overall competitiveness of the US and productivity growth, energy prices are gonna be lower in the US, they're much higher in Europe, that's a competitive disadvantage for Europe. However, uh, first of all, the restriction on exports of uh, 
gas slowly, slowly are going to be removed. There'll be approval of a number of licenses for exports of liquefied natural gas. That's going to push lower natural gas prices around the world. Secondly, of course, there are reserves of natural gas throughout the world for technological reasons and environmental constraints. Those may not be developed as fast as the US, but eventually be greater supply. And in the meanwhile, as it's become cheaper using gas rather than coal, there's been massive increase in the exports by the United States of coal to Europe, and that's pushed down and lowered the prices of coal. So while you're not yet able to export cheap natural gas because of the constraints of investing into the stuff and the restrictions, the exports of coal are a substitute for exports of LNG. And that, at the margin, of course, is somehow beneficial also for Europe. But definitely, unless uh, Europe is going to have a different uh, policy towards energy, whether it's traditional ones, alternative or otherwise, that's going to be an element of loss of competitiveness of Europe relative to the United States. But in the US, that increase in productivity is going to be mostly concentrated in the few sectors of the economy that are highly energy intensive. I wouldn't say there'll be a massive resurgence of manufacturing across the board. Thank you. I shouldn't be the only one enjoying uh, asking questions. Uh, are there questions in the floor for Mr. Nouriel? Please, there is one at the front. Just please identify yourself. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Raza from uh, Mari Petroleum Company from Pakistan. Uh, I want to draw your attention uh, uh, to South Asia, uh, where, of course, uh, the US sanctions against uh, Iran are in place. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, this is affecting Iran's neighbors as well. Uh, you are aware, you know, that the Iran-Pakistan-India pipeline was to come up. Uh, now it's only going to be the Iran-Pakistan uh, gas pipeline uh, because India, uh, under pressure probably, or because of other reasons, uh, has decided to leave this project. Uh, similarly, Iran is not permitted, uh, you know, to do trade with Afghanistan. And uh, we fear that the consequences of this uh, after 2014 probably would be very grave uh, when the ISAF uh, and the U.S. forces leave Afghanistan. Probably it is going to lead to much greater instability in Afghanistan as well as in Pakistan, which is acutely short of energy. So may I have your views on, on the, the effects of the U.S. sanctions on Iran? Iran, thank you. <coughs> Well, you know, uh, there are plenty of effects of those sanctions uh, 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 on Iran. Uh, of course, the reduction in exports uh, of Iran could have led uh, to some higher price of oil, but given that the demand conditions are soft this year and increasing supply coming from North America is significant, that impact uh, has been uh, so far subdued. As I pointed out, compared to a year ago, the fear premium in oil prices has been lower because for the time being, US has convinced Israel to successfully wait and be patient for sanctions and for negotiation to work. Uh, restricting exports of Iranian oil to countries that are importing oil from Iran has an impact, of course, on their supply of oil. And there are countries in Asia that have significant imports from, uh, from Iran. That may lead, all in all, to negative effect on economic growth. Of course, the entire Middle Eastern region remains uh, politically unstable, given the consequences of the, of the Arab Spring. There is still fragility in Afghanistan, as the US eventually is going to exit. Uh, your country, you're more of an expert than I am about Pakistan and the economic and political challenges. Uh, and I don't want to make a judgment on whether the current policy of the United States of imposing even tighter sanction on Iran is the right one or not, whether it's going to be successful or not. Uh, the issue is that many people in the world do believe that a situation in which eventually Iran becomes nuclear is going to be destabilized in the Middle East because other countries are going to go and try to build a bomb from Saudi Arabia, they can go to even your country and buy one or two of those bombs, to Turkey, to Iraq, to Egypt, and having a Middle East where half a dozen relatively unstable countries all have a bomb may not be a situation that leads to long-term stability. Of course, my personal view is that if you can provide carrots and sticks that convince Iran to credibly give up on the option on having a bomb, it's going to be a better world for everybody. If those negotiations and sanctions fail, I think it's going to be pretty ugly either way. 
because either the US blinks and bluffs and whether they like it or not, they accept containment as a way of dealing with a nuclear Iran and that's not going to be optimal because other countries in the region are going to nuclearize or if the US truly believes that containment is not going to be its policy and it's not bluffing, then the US, not just Israel, is going to attack Iran. That's going to lead to a spike in oil prices and push us in another global recession and a global financial crisis. So I think those are fundamental problems. Different people have different views. I would say solution is a compromise that prevents Iran from becoming nuclear and leads to stability in the Middle East will be a preferable one. If that doesn't occur, the choice of attacking or not attacking, each one of them has very ugly consequences for the region and for the global economy. <clears throat> yes, sir, there's one on the right. Uh, my name is Rauf from Mari Petroleum, Pakistan. Uh, my question is that you mentioned that Iran, if sanctions are put on, it will have very diverse effect on oil price. But you might have observed that recently uh, Libya's sanctions have been over. It was under embargo under 2011, right? So now it can sell its oil in open market. Iraq has proven reserves like 150 billion barrels estimated just recently. How do you see that selling these two countries their oil in open market and one country if under sanctions won't be able to sell, will have diverse effect, as you mentioned. Well, you know, the total effect and impact uh, depends on many factors. You know, there is the reduction in uh, exports by Iran, that everything else equal should lead to less uh, global supply and higher oil prices. However, if you give time to sanction negotiation to work, then the fear premium that was very high last year is lower today than it was a year ago, and that pushes prices lower. And then, of course, the equilibrium of demand and supply implies that depending on the supply coming to the market from Iraq, uh, from Libya, from the increase in supply in North America, oil sands, shell, and, uh, shell oil, uh, offshore ones, together with a slow soft patch in the global economy that implies slower demand growth, all those factors together then give you the equilibrium uh, oil prices. So you cannot just take in isolation, of course, the effects of those sanctions on the export supply by Iran, but you have to look at the, all the dimensions of demand and supply in many other parts of the world to get to the equilibrium of what oil prices are right now. And those sanctions in particular are only one of the factors that affects then those supply and demand conditions. Good days. I would say we do one more questions and then we anyway, unfortunately, already running over time, but the gentleman in the front, and then. Spiro uh, Carnesi, from European Navigation. Uh, Mr. Rubin, uh, the result, I understand, of uh, economies uh, bubbles, as you say, it's probably the cheap, probably the cheap money. So if you were in the position of uh, Fed, how would you handle the interest rate with a view to avoid classes, as you said, on 2015-17? Well, you know, I mean, uh, my view on that is that um, there is a big dilemma. Everybody is obsessed now about uh, tapering off, whether it's sooner or later, but there's a deeper dilemma that the Fed is going to face in the next few years. The economic recovery is slow. Unemployment is high. That ratio for housing and government are uh, relatively high. Therefore, everything else equal, you're going to have QE for longer, zero policy rate for longer, and like in the last cycle, we're going to exit and normalize very slowly. That implies we're not going to normalize until sometime in 2017. And the real economy justifies that. On the other side, you have already fraughtness in financial market, and one more year of QE, one more year of zero policy rates, and a slow normalization implies that fraughtness is going to become a generalized bubble. So you have two objectives, and you have one instrument. Now, within the Fed, some people like Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke say, how would address this dilemma? They say there are two objectives, economic stability and financial stability, but we have also two instruments. We can use the interest rate instrument and exit slowly to stabilize the economy, and if there is fraughtiness in financial market, we're gonna use macro prudential regulation and supervision of the financial system, credit controls, margin requirements, high loan to value ratios as a way of avoiding another bubble. 
That's one view. You have two objectives, you have two instruments. Interest rates for the real economy, macro prudential for financial market. Within the Fed, however, there's another school of people, Jeremy Stein, Dan Tarullo, the Hawks, who say macro pru is not gonna work. It's untested, you control leveraging one part of the banking system, the liquidity goes into another part of the banking system, you regulate leverage all, all across the banking system, the liquidity is gonna go to the shadow banking system, and they say the only instrument that can enter in all the cracks of the financial system is the interest rate. Macro proof is not gonna work. Suppose they're right, and macro proof is not gonna work. Then you have a problem, because you have one instrument and two objectives that are going in opposite direction. So either you go slow with the exit because the economy needs it, and then you exit very slowly and you cause a huge financial bubble, or if Jeremy Stein says, let's use the interest instrument faster to avoid the bubble, then you have a risk of a bond market crash and a crash of the real economy. And people like Janet Yellen say, if we exit too, too fast, we're gonna repeat what happened in 94, we're gonna have a hard landing of the economy, hard landing of the bond market, then there's gonna be a collapse of asset prices. So I think that's gonna be the most fundamental dilemma that the face is gonna face. People anxious about tapering off September, December, whatever not, that's peanuts compared to exit uh, from these zero policy rates in the next three, four years, and the dilemma. Do you care about financial stability? Do you care about real economic stability? If the two objectives are opposite to each other and you have only one policy instrument, you want to make one mistake or the other. That's a much more serious challenge for the Fed than when you start tapering off. Nirel, very interesting insights. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Great being with you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Thanks for your Thank questions. You.